up, swashbucklers? You're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 28. My name is Phil Johnson. I'm your host for the show. Thank you for tuning in, listening in. If you're new to the show, welcome. Welcome to the island. It's a good time here. Uh, fun fact, in the uh, code for international direct dial phone calls, plus 28 is unassigned. So you know what that means. That means when one of you, when 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 you listening, start a new pirate haven, a new Nassau, a new New Providence, a new Tortuga, a new Madagascar, that's your international code for dialing, plus 28. Uh, maybe we should just take over the number 28. Like, stoners have 420, and that's just like their number, right? Maybe pirates should just be 28, since that's an assi- unassigned number for international calling. I don't know. I might feel differently about that next week in episode 29. But anyway, today on the show is part two of my interview with diver John Chatterton. Uh, Great feedback on last week's episode. Uh, Super cool. The guy's great. He's got super great stories. And uh, if you don't know, if you didn't listen yet, you can go back and listen to part one, um, or you can just dive in today. Uh, If you're adventurous, that's cool. That's all good. Uh, John Chatterton was the the subject of a, a book called Pirate Hunters by Robert Curson, not Kirsten. No, there's no T in it. Like I said repeatedly during the interview, I'm kind of a dumb dumb, but that's okay. Uh, Pirate Hunters by Robert Kirsten. Also, another uh, book called Shadow Hunters, also by Robert Kirsten. That one is when John Chatterton and his crew went out and found a World War II uh, U.S. Uh, um, German U boat that uh, was missing uh, under the ocean and that kind of stuff. So, I'm going to play you part two of the John Chatterton interview today. Uh, we're going to get into Titanic, which is super interesting. And he is going to drop a few knowledge bombs on you that, uh, I mean, stuff that I'd never heard about Titanic before. I think you're really, really going to dig it. And uh, what I did is uh, I included like the, a couple of minutes of part one at the beginning of the interview so they can kind of get caught up since it's been a week and all. You can kind of get caught up to where we were in the interview and then we will go on from there. And uh, I think you're you're super going to enjoy it. Um, so here's the thing. Here's a, a thing I would like you to do. Uh, I am... I would like to play you on my show. Here's here's the scoop. If you're going to a pirate festival, if you're going to a, a pirate museum, if you're doing something cool and interesting and piratey, I would like to get a trip report from you to play on the show. So here's all you have to do. Call 408-599-2733 and leave me a voicemail there uh, with your story, your pirate adventure, your festival report, whatever it is that you would like uh, me to know about. And if it's cool, I will play it on the show. So again, that number is 408 408- Five nine nine two seven three three, and that is my Google Voice number, and you can leave it right there. So, man, what a weekend! Um, my my schedule is all weird and thrown off. Um, which you might think, as a traveling comedian, I live on that weird thrown off schedule all the time. But uh, it's it's on and off. Usually, I'm I'm a pretty habit driven person, but this weekend was super uh, out there. Uh, I did uh, three shows over the weekend, which involved all told sixteen hours of driving. Uh, Because none of them were particularly close to home, but not far away enough that I needed a hotel. So there was like that weird middle ground and um, and kind of strange gigs all the way around too. thank if you came out. Thank you for being there. Um, You know what was happening. But uh, the the, the Thursday night show uh, was in the foyer of a theater uh, because apparently I'm not big enough to play the theater, but I can play the foyer of a theater. And uh, it was a big echoey uh, foyer of a theater, which meant uh, it was hard to hear. The audience was there, there. They were trying, but it's exhausting trying to uh, listen to a comedian in an echo chamber. So we all did the best we could. Uh, uh, Friday night uh, was a benefit for Autism Speaks in Modesto at the Queen Bean, uh, which was quite the adventure. Uh, I drove uh, three and a half hours to get there, and that was approximately an hour for each audience member. Um, <laughs> yes, small audience. I think we overall had maybe six people in the audience, not counting the other comedians on the show. Uh, I did a game a half hour, so it was still fun. The sound system was absolutely atrocious. Um, it was, it was just broken. It was sadly broken. And, uh, so it was a strange, it was a difficult show, but we made it through that one. And then Saturday night was a very fun show in Murphy's, California at a place called the Mad Cow, which is a, a crepe place. Not uh, like crepes, you know, like the French crepes. Yeah. And uh, it's a new place that they are doing comedy shows there. And uh, we had a a fun sold out crowd. But during that day in Murphy's, they had been doing it's a wine tasting place. Right. And so they had for twenty dollars, you got a wine glass. You then got to go around wine tasting all day with your glass, uh, which meant by the time I got to them at approximately eight thirty, 
they were so drunk and getting sleepy. Uh, so that was an adventure. Um, it was uh, it was about getting laughs. It was about entertaining. It was also about trying to keep them awake. Um, so that was a, an interesting weekend. So uh, super, yeah. It was I was working for my money this weekend, friends. Uh, Sixteen hours of driving, uh, three gigs totaling about two hours on stage, uh, and then I I spent Sunday. Uh, doing tax preparation. So it only got more and more interesting uh, as the, I did tax preparation and I binged watched uh, Mark Marin on Netflix. So uh, not all bad. I have to be doing something productive uh, when I watch TV like that. So it, it was all good. But um, yeah, weird when the schedule gets thrown off. I can't, like I had to drink extra caffeine today and it still hasn't kicked in yet. And I'm, I'm hoping, hoping it kicks in soon because it's a big uh, long week ahead uh, as well. Why? Why? Because I'm going to Canada. I am uh, set to leave for Canada on Thursday. I will be in the Edmonton, uh, Alberta, uh, Canada area doing a bunch of gigs and additional weirdness. Uh, what I mean by that is usually I know where I'm going when I get on a plane. Uh, and in this case, I know what city I'm going to. I have a kind of an idea of where I'm playing, but this promoter uh, does has not given me all the details yet. Um, I'm not sure where I'm staying. I'm not sure where I'm performing. Uh, I will get off the plane. He will pick me up and I will go uh, spend a week and a half telling jokes wherever he needs me to tell jokes, um, which is terrifying. Uh, this is not uh, not my first time uh, outside of the country doing comedy. I did do the um, the uh, Fringe Festival in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, but that was about 10 years ago. And uh, so I have uh, this is I'm going to my first time telling jokes in Canada. I don't know where I'm going and I'm not sure where I'm even uh, staying. And I will be up there for a week and a half. So if you happen to be in the Edmonton, Canada uh, area or if you have friends there, I will probably need a little bit of moral support on this trip. It'll be very strange. Uh, normally, I would be completely freaked out about this, except for I have friends who have done who've worked for this promoter before, my friend uh, Miles Weber, uh, uh, Kirk McHenry, and uh, Corey Robinson. Uh, they all did this before me and gave me kind of the lowdown on what's going on. So I have an idea of where we're going, but um, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. Uh, when I when I talk to you next Tuesday, I will have gotten through the first weekend of it, and I'll have some better ideas of uh, where that's going. So anyway, uh, if you're in the Edmonton, Canada area uh, anywhere this week, uh, you can catch me up there. I'll be up there the 18th. Through the 28th, I know I'm playing the Comedy Factory. Uh, I know I'm playing a casino in a town that I can't remember the name of. Uh, I'm playing Leduc, and that's all I know. Uh, I don't really have any more information than that. In March, uh, I have a couple of California shows I'll be doing. I'll also be in Illinois and Iowa and uh, Vancouver, Canada. So I'm making making my second trip uh, to Canada. That one I know. That one's a club. Uh, it's going to be great shows. That one's going to that's at a place called Laugh Lines in Vancouver. So uh, check that out. And um, yeah, if you're curious about where I'm going to be uh, performing at any given time, you can just go to underthecrossbones.com and click on the uh, the tour dates button, and that will let you know. And I love seeing you guys at the shows. That's super awesome. Uh, I also I got a new single out. Uh, if you didn't hear it in the last episode, I have a new single out called The Legend of Ms. Garcia, which is about the Spanish teacher from my high school. Uh I know it doesn't sound that exciting, but it's a funny ass song uh, and I want you to have it. And I was going to give it to you for free, but Bandcamp didn't have a way for me to set that up to you for to give you for free. Um, special free for you, like everybody else is paying for it. I wanted to give it free for you, but I got the next best thing. It is 95 percent off for you, which means you can get my new song, The Legend of Miss Garcia, for a nickel. Five cents, just a nickel. That's all it is. So the way you get that, you can go check it out at underthecrossbones.com slash Garcia and use the promo code CROSSBONES uh, to get my new single for just five cents, um, which I probably won't see any of anyway after fees. So uh, I'm giving it to you for free. You're only paying a nickel. That's all right. Uh, and that's good till the end of February. So uh, if you're listening after the end of February, you get to pay a dollar for the song. Um, but if you're listening before the end of February, go check that out. Under the crossbones.com slash Garcia. Use the promo code crossbones. Um, hope you're enjoying the show. We got some uh, great stuff. I got killer guests coming up for you. Uh, we're just all sorts of stuff. We, we're going to be talking uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, rides, movies, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're going to be talking um, uh, pirate uh, woodworking. Yes. Got some of that. Uh, we're going to be talking, uh, more, uh, I have another author coming on. It's just uh, so much good stuff coming up. You're going to totally want to make sure that you're subscri subscribed. And if you're enjoying the show, I hope you'll help uh, support a little bit too. Uh, and the way you do that is you can go to under the slash support. And on that page, you have a couple options. 
Uh, one is just drop a donation in the PayPal box. Super easy. Takes no time. You can also click on the Amazon banner there and buy yourself something nice. I get a little piece of that when you do that. Actually, any of the book or music or, you know, those kinds of links that are in the show notes and things, uh, I get a little piece of those. So make sure you click it on through when you're going to go buy yourself something at Amazon. That's very, very helpful. And if you want to be a sponsor of the show, it is stupid cheap. Uh, to do that, and uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, the uh, people that listen to the show do partake of the sponsors. Uh, I, I don't need to give you exact numbers, but they definitely they are really good numbers. Uh, so if you have a pirate themed business of some sort that you would like me to promote on the show, we can make that happen for very little money. So all that information is at underthecrossbones.com slash support. Okay. Let's say we get into this interview. How about that, huh? Here is part two of my interview with John Chatterton. We are talking shipwrecks. Here we go. What was different? You said because you said you had uh, previously mostly worked on on steel ships, and this was different because it was colonial, it was wooden. What were some of the? I mean, some of the sort of technically differences between trying to find a steel ship and a wooden ship. Um, what you know, it, number one. You know, big steel wrecks, you know, the Andrea Doria, the Lusitania, uh-huh. the Titanic, Britannic, uh, um, sh- ships like that, big steel wrecks. When when you find the wreck, I, I mean, they're, relatively speaking, intact. Uh-huh. In, in other words, you know, you have a bow, you have a stern, you, you know, if uh, I, I found uh, a wreck uh, from World War One called the uh, the Carolina it was a steamship sunk by in World War One off the coast of Atlantic City by a German U-boat. Sure, yeah. And, and you know, I, I ended up recovering, go, going to uh, court and getting the salvage rights to the wreck and, and salvaging the, the purser safe from, uh-huh. from first class. But it's like, you know, you're... You're kind of, you know, you're you're looking at the wreck and everything's kind of there. Uh-huh. When you're dealing with colonial period wrecks, in many cases, it, it's going to be under coral. It's going to be under sand. It's it's going to be it's it's not a visual entity that you can look at. So okay. you, okay. you have to kind of excavate. You you have to before you can visually process the information. You, you have to get down. And, and sometimes I, I've gone after wrecks that were, you, you know, I mean, very, very little of, of the wooden structure uh, um, left. And, and, you know, I mean, you, you're looking at ballast stones uh-huh. and, and it's like, okay, well, you know, is this everything? How, how did, how did these uh, uh, ballast stones end up here. In other words, did the ship roll? Did the ship come to rest and sink? So, it, you know, I mean, when visually, when you see a big steel wreck, you end up knowing instantly a lot more than you do on a, a you know, a, a, a older wreck or colonial period wreck, where um, you're not sure wh- whatever you find. You know, you, you're, you're. It's only one piece of a bigger puzzle when uh you know one of my favorite uh, parts of the the book was when you and john matera went to visit uh before you had even started you visited the the other treasure hunter guy whose name i can't remember and he had this house full of treasure and a bathtub full of gold Tr- balloons. Tracy Bowden. yes that was yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was i was just so flabbergasted that he would have that much stuff in his house um well yeah actually actually they, they were uh, um uh, uh, you know, silver pieces of uh-huh. of eight. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, not gold, not not gold or scudos. You start getting, you, you know, you start getting all, all, all you know, coin litter. It's, uh, uh, you know, like I said, no, no head for details. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, 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 they were, they were reals, Spanish mm. reals and silver. Okay, but uh, yeah, it, you know, I, I mean, and, and I gotta say, you know, just you know, coins are just coins. You know, right now it's like if I got a pocket full of coins, it's like it's more of a pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, you go you go to pull something out of your pocket and you're dropping coins off the ground. It's it's like uh, you know, half of the time you use your debit card because you don't <laughs> want change back. Right, <laughs> but uh, um, y- you know, <clears throat> old coins. Uh, especially shipwreck coins, uh-huh. 
that, you know, I mean, there is, there is something, there's something there. First of all, they have real weight to them. Sure. Uh, um, and, and, you know, I mean, you can literally be digging through, you can have your hand reaching into a space in, into, into sand or silt. And, and when, if you, you, you know, immediately when you feel a coin, huh. it may not be coin shaped. It may, it may have some, uh, um, encrustation or marine growth, or it may be encrusted to something else. But, uh, um, when you, uh, when you have it, when you feel it, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, the difference between silver and gold and, um, you know, regular stuff. What is your, what's your view of what should be done with things like that? Is it, I mean, to you, is it something that should be kept safe and in, in, in a closet or shown to the public or put on the auction block or what, what do you think about that type of thing? <laughs> Well, you know, if you look at international law, admiralty law, uh-huh. which uh, um, essentially all shipwrecks fall under admiralty law in one way or another, sure. uh, um, you know, things on the bottom of the ocean that may may belong to, you know, in the United States, it's out three miles out belongs to the states, out to twelve miles is federal waters. Beyond that, we have an economic zone, but uh-huh. if it's a shipwreck, it, it's governed by admiralty law, which has, you know, been in place for, for hundreds of years. And, uh, you know, international uh, convention determines who does what. Uh-huh. And if you, if, you, if you look at the law, the law essentially accommodates everybody. It, it accommodates archaeologists, it accommodates commercial salvers, it accommodates uh-huh. recreational divers, it accommodates fishermen, mining companies, oil drilling, all sorts of things. There's room for everybody. Oh, well, that's good. I, I, think, I think it is greedy for any one party to say, no, everybody has to do what I do. Mm-hmm. And, and, and every, every shipwreck, every, uh, uh, everything pulled up from, we're not going to take anything from the seabed. Uh-huh. Well, in some cases, things might be left better left on, on the seabed, but in some cases, not necessarily uh-huh. the selling of artifacts, having artifacts in, in people's personal possession. Well, uh, you know, uh, I'm. Again, it is. It depends on the particulars. Uh-huh. I think some some artifacts do belong in a museum, but I, I don't think that private ownership should be uh, um, outlawed or, or disallowed. Uh-huh. And I think the people that do uh, uh, preach to the choir. Are, are defending their, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to defend their own side. Sure. You, you, you know, so it, it, I think, I think it's silly for, uh, you know, archeologists, uh, um, you know, there, there are some fine Marine archeologists out there and there are some guys that are literally just dead weight. <laughs> you know, it, it, the thing is they don't want somebody else accomplishing anything because Uh it makes them look bad for doing nothing. Oh yes. So, uh, um, I, I think that the, the people that want to play politics and, uh, you know, will, will, uh, go out and and talk a lot of crap, but, um, you know, that doesn't find shipwrecks. Sure. And it doesn't make people, it doesn't make people aware of history. It doesn't rewrite history. Uh huh. So I, I think to to say, oh, we're we're not going to excavate shipwrecks. We're not going to recover artifacts. We're not going to work on shipwrecks. I, I think is very short sighted. And and the the only the only people that benefit from that are the people who are saying, well, while nobody's doing that. I'll take care of this for you. (laughs) 
<laughs> and by the way, I wasn't really going to do anything anyway. Right, right. So. <laughs> Now you've done a you've done a lot in bringing the the wrecks that you've been to uh, to the public by doing a TV shows and, and and specials and things like that. Why do you think it's important to bring that type of uh, history and content and information to a more general public? Well, I, you know, I think the element of history is is important. I, I, I view history as incredibly exciting, and, and you know what. If you can't figure out where you've been, how are you going to figure out where you're going? Right. <laughs> so I, I I think from from a from a, a civilization standpoint, it is it is really important that that we have an appreciation of of history, and I think history is uh, 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 modern day students don't really have the same kind of excitement for history that I do. And uh-huh. I think maybe it's, they're just not looking at it the right way. So uh, if I can somehow, some way uh, um, share my enthusiasm for history, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it makes a difference. Maybe it inspires somebody else to uh, uh, work on a, a, a project or Take a look at something. I, I, I love the idea of of taking the uh, the status quo and and saying, you know, man, maybe that's that's not necessarily the way it is. He, to take a historical record and, and kind of re- have have the opportunity to to contribute something new and different to it. Uh huh. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, that's and I think you're right about the the way history is taught and things like that. I was never a history fan in school, and once I got out of school and started reading it for myself, I became fascinated with with all of it. So that absolutely makes sense. Well, you, you know, the, the the other thing is, you know, it is inextricably linked to people. I mean, <laughs> history history is about people. You know, it's not about you know, of events. It's not about, uh, um, you know, dates and numbers and crap like that. Right. It's about people. And uh, I think somehow, some way it it is that that part kind of gets lost. And I think that's, that's the thing that has been so exciting about working with, with Rob Curson and that Rob Curson, you know, Rob Curson makes you think the book is about, uh, uh, pirates or the, or the book is about German U boats uh-huh. or, or the book is about shipwrecks. But in reality, it, you know, I mean, it's about people, right? It, it's, a, it's about German U boat sailors, or it's about, uh, uh, you know, pirate captains. And, and you, you know, it, it's about who these people are. It's about divers, right? Yes. And, and, and you know, personal relationships. Uh, and that's why, Rob's books have have been successful and, and you know I mean that that quite literally is the thing that makes uh, all of us that uh, uh look for shipwrecks you know get up in the morning excited to throw our you know boots on and yeah. <laughs> go out and you know try and try and do whatever the next project is yeah, yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, I would have much rather have read a history textbook by Robert Kirsten uh, than any of the ones I had, because uh, his writing is fascinating. Well, you know what? He he is an absolutely ruthless researcher, and I think I don't remember what it was for for pirate hunters, but I I remember when when we were working on shadow divers, uh-huh. I, I think he spent about uh, fifteen months researching the book. Wow. And, and I mean, he, you know, he, he was, he was talking to, you know, I, I mean, I talked to a guy who was in your eighth grade class, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, the, and the, the first thing he said, you know, I mean, we, we'd been working on the book for about three or four months uh-huh. and, he, and he, he came to Richie and I, and he was like, listen, uh, um, I, 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 I it, it, this is all wrong. He said, "You know, we've been we've been thinking that this was about a book about U-boats and the German sailors, and we're like, yeah." And he's like, uh, 
He said, this story is really about, it's about people. And we're like, well, you know, whatever, Rob, that, you know, you're the writer. <laughs> Thanks for touching base with us. You know? <laughs> it's like, and he's like, well, that means that I, I got to get more involved in, in you guys and your lives. And we're like, oh, well, okay. Uh-huh. Uh, if that's the way you think you got to go, we believe in you as a writer. So, you know, do what you got to do. And he's like, good. Cause the first thing I want to do is talk to your ex-wives. It's like, <laughs> oh, oh man, <laughs> no, 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 not them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's where the real dirt is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. And, and so, you know, I mean, quite, quite literally, you know, I mean, we're working on a shipwreck project is, is this, is, you know, it's, it's this journey of, of, you know, discovery and it's the, you know, it, 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 you know, it's like there's a scarecrow with uh-huh. a cowardly lion. And, uh, you know, there's all these people you meet along the yellow brick road. Sure. And, and it, uh, you know, but I mean, you, you, if you work on a book project, at least with Rob Curson, it's also kind of a voyage of discovery, uh-huh. you know, because he just he 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 is so ruthless in his research, and I mean you know I mean sometimes you know sometimes he comes up with stuff and you're like you know he's like why didn't you tell me this I like, hey, you know I didn't even remember you know or or that's not the way I remember it sure and so you know I mean it, it is you you start to understand more about yourself and other people and all that kind of thing but uh, um. You know, I think Rob, Rob is an incredibly talented, generous writer. Uh, um, be, people love his work, and, and for me, have had the opportunity to work with him not once but twice. It is I mean, it's a real honor. I, I am I am truly flattered uh, uh, that he's he's taken the time to write two books about projects that I've been involved in uh-huh. and, um, and, and people have responded so well, people, you know, I mean, you know, best selling books. Yeah, no, they're, 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 I've read the one, I have to go back and read the other one. There's so many good books to read, but I definitely have to get to that one. I wanted to ask you when you, I read that you'd been to the Andrea Doria like 160 times at this point. Yeah, I think, I think, I think I'm up around 164 or something like that. Yeah. When you have visited a wreck that many times, does it begin to feel homey to you? Do you, or is there still surprises oh, every time? Yeah. Oh, no, there, there's still surprises, but you know, I mean, you, you, you know, I, I mean, the things that you're looking to do start to become more and more, I, I mean, a big wreck like the Dory, you know, you, you, when you, start to the more you know the more the greater your capability uh-huh. you know there's things things start to become possible now that were possible a hundred times ago like what that's an interesting statement well yeah, go, go, going uh, you know there are places you can go especially when you start talking about getting into the uh, the interior of, of shipwrecks wreck, or shipwreck penetration uh-huh uh, um, you know, it, it is the, the biggest, the, the, the greatest hazard is getting lost or turned around and, sure. uh, not being able to make your way back out, uh-huh. which is in diving fatalities, not all that uncommon, I, but sure. it, yeah. if you, the, the, the more, the more you, you know about a wreck, the more you understand the wreck, the more familiar you become with it. The the further you're willing to push yourself, uh-huh. so you, you may go to places that other divers would never even with with less experience would would never even in a million years consider going. I see, and, and um, you know, for for any given dive, you, you know, you need education, you need experience, you need the equipment, sure. and uh, each component is very important. Um, and you know, the, the experience thing, the more experience you have, the more capable you become. Sure. Yeah, of course. Of course. When you went to Titanic, did you find anything unexpected about it? Something that, that surprised you? Um, 
you know, Titanic was another one of those kind of like journeys that, uh, um, you know, you don't find what you expect you're that you're going to find. Uh-huh. And what we literally were going with the assumption that uh, uh, we, we had a guy who said he had seen ribbons of steel on the bottom, pieces of the Titanic's hull that had been gouged out of the bottom by the iceberg when it ran up onto the iceberg, in uh-huh. which it didn't it didn't uh, strike a glancing blow as uh, uh, people had had assumed. And uh, it rode up onto it, and there was a spur on the iceberg that actually gouged out the bottom. Oh wow! We thought we thought we were going to prove that story, uh-huh. and ultimately, um, that didn't happen. Huh. But what we did was what we we found by by going places where nobody else had ever been. We found the the pieces of the double bottom the the hull uh-huh. literally where where titanic broke apart and and you know i mean we're all familiar with the movie titanic where the stern raises up in the air right. and the ship breaks into uh, um well the reality and, and and the reality is it it didn't raise more than 10 degrees oh really oh that's interesting so it, it is and and we can say 10 degrees because when we found these pieces of bottom literally these are the sections all the way from port to starboard the 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 pieces where the ship broke uh-huh and so when engineers scientists look at the, the you know they they have tension and compression they they look at the steel and they say we can interpret this that the you other know, thing and they can create flooding studies computerize it and they were like no at maximum of 10 degrees huh that's interesting and um well and but you know, and the interesting part is like, oh, that's interesting. So it didn't really go up in the air like with Rose and uh, <laughs> Jack hanging yeah. on the back. And, uh, um, but, it, but it, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, when we start saying, you know, the, it, the Titanic, there's, there's uh, you know, all this loss of life. There, there's uh, um, 750 survivors, but. There were 500 empty seats in the lifeboats. Oh, huh. five, 500 empty seats. Well, why were there 500 empty seats? Right. 500, 500 empty seats. Well, you know, quite frankly, the experience of the people who, who stayed behind, who didn't get in the lifeboats, there was not that feeling of urgency. I mean, yeah, you know, Thomas Andrews and, 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 and the, the captain and, uh, you know, some of the, the, the crew that were involved in engineering, they understood how serious the problem was, right. but the, the average pass- passengers didn't. And, and quite literally, they did not, were, were probably mostly unaware until, until the ship went down. That That's an entirely different experience, human experience when you sure. start to think of it. And, and so it, it, it's, you know the 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 it, it, the end kind of snuck up on everybody uh-huh. more so than than came with the, this this terrible vision of of you know dread and and doom, which I suppose is a better way to go. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, yeah, you know, is it, you know, they say, they, they talk about the band playing on the, you know, they could hear the band playing uh-huh. on deck and, and it's like, well, you know, they, yes, they, you know, they, they, they played to the very end. Well, yes, they played to the very end, but they probably like most of the other passengers didn't have that awareness that the end was near. Uh-huh. It certainly seemed to make a lot more sense. Do you want to get in that little tiny wood boat or stay on the big steel boat? Somebody <laughs> right. will probably get us. <laughs> yeah. I suppose if they didn't really know that it was, if, if it was that bad now, when, uh, from the moment, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but from the moment that they discovered that it was that bad to when it actually sank, do you know what kind of amount of time that was? You know, it, it literally it w- would have been at the time where the ship broke up, and, and it would have been you know a couple of minutes. Oh, okay, wow, 
Huh? That's that's amazing. You know, and, and of course, the, you know, they had they had two hearings at the time, and they both concluded that the the ship did not break up. Uh huh. Even though it obviously you know, did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Even though, well, it, and, and you know, but you know, at the same time, you know, I mean, they basically said we got to make the, we can't say that the ship broke it too. Right. But because that they felt it would impact British shipbuilding, but uh, at the same time, Titanic was was built in a way. You know, it, it, the assumption is Titanic broke apart. It was shoddy uh, construction or engineering or manufacturing or whatever. Titanic was built stronger than the standards for ships that are built today. Uh huh. So, it, you know, you, you, you start, then it kind of leads you back to, well, well, you know, what was, what was the problem? Oh, you know, too much water coming in too fast in the wrong places. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that seems like, yeah, that would be a problem. Um, but, uh, it, you know, all of that. And, and again, you know, any, anytime you're, you're having the opportunity to, to dive a rack, it, it, it's a great opportunity to, to, look at history and, and see if the wreck can somehow, some way give us uh, a, a greater understanding or a different perspective on, on the historical context and, and what it, what it meant to the people involved. Yeah, absolutely. It, have you, what is there that you haven't done that you would like to do in, in the context of wreck diving? Um, you know, gosh, I, I don't know. I, 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 you know, people ask me all the time, you know, <clears throat> what's your favorite shipwreck? And I always say the next one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've, you know, I'm working on a couple of uh, different projects and, and um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the guy that likes to tell people what I'm going to do. I'm more the guy that wants to tell people what I've already done. Yeah. That makes sense. And, and uh, it, it, you know, it, it, I don't, I, I don't, Whatever, whatever projects I undertake, whatever I try to accomplish, I I, I do it for my own personal edification. Uh-huh. Uh, I have I have a sense of uh, it, you know uh, uh, real affection for these shipwrecks and that kind of thing. I, I don't need to play to the crowds or or media. And, and after the fact, if Rob Carson wants to write a book or <laughs> you know something like that, it it's. You know, uh, I'm I'm always shocked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully, I know the I know both those books have been optioned for films too. So hopefully, we'll get to see the uh, the live action thing, and you can make a cameo. Uh, you know, <laughs> God, God forbid, God forbid, I should make a cameo. <laughs> so, I mean, l- I, I, lately in the it seems in the um, in the shipwreck community uh, as such, there's been there's been more action recently. Or maybe it's just because I'm paying attention more, but it seems like I mean we've the the San Jose they're excavating now, and then uh, Chris McCourt yeah. was telling me they're digging up a bunch of stuff near Madagascar and things like that. Do you feel like the the discoveries are accelerating, and is that due to technology, or what do you think? No, I think it's a technology thing. They're looking at uh, they're looking at deeper wrecks. Uh-huh. Uh, um, y- you know, they're they're uh, not, not that they haven't worked uh, deep wrecks before. Um, you know, they're, they're also, I think, uh, looking at, um, the, uh, uh, Central America and a few other things. You know, a lot of it, ha- a lot of it has to do with technology and, and, uh, financial feasibility of, mm. of doing some of these wrecks, which is the thing, you know, if, if we, we, we leave all the world shipwrecks up to the academics, uh, um, you know, I mean, they, they, uh, they're going to, the only thing they have money for is a couple of meetings and maybe we'll get some <laughs> graduate students and we'll charter a boat. And, uh, it, it, you know, I mean, most of these projects, especially deep water projects are, are you know, risky financial uh-huh. endeavors. And, um, you know, if, if they figure everything right, they're going to be successful. And, and if not, um, you know, then they're going to be sucking wind. Huh. Interesting. And where does the financial return come from in, in something like that? Is it from the artifacts that come up or is there some other way of monetizing something like that? Well, you know, generally speaking, it's, it's the artifacts and, and, you know, I mean, typically speaking, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to go after a rack with, 
no way of getting a return on your investment. Sure. Uh, um, it, you know, I mean, unless it's, you know, certainly nothing where you're going to be spending a lot of money. Right. I, I mean, you know, I say that, but you know, I, I mean, I totally funded the U boat and John Matera and I totally funded everything we did in the Dominican Republic, uh-huh. um, you know, our, our, ourselves, but uh, um, it, it, you know, I mean, if you're putting big money out for a deep water uh, uh, exploration, it, it's how, how do you get your money back? And you know, if you, if you come up with with unique artifacts from the seabed, they're gonna they're gonna make their way into museums. They're gonna make their way into to uh, books and the historical record and all sure. that kind of thing. And, but, you know, I mean, if, if, if you come up with, uh, you know, I mean, a half million coins, do you really need a museum for all half million <laughs> coins? A couple will do. <laughs> you know, is there, yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. You know, I, I, I mean, seriously. And, and, you know, I mean, when we were working in the, the Dominican Republic, there, there would be a, a, you know, they currently have all the gold, the police artifacts, but, um, you know, I mean, we, we we had a deal where there was going to be a sharing of, of the artifacts. We'll probably end up with with some of those, but okay. um, you, you know, the the stuff that is culturally historic or or unique or important, uh, you know, that stuff definitely goes in a museum. Sure, yeah, but uh, you know, uh, you, you're. It, if if you go down to uh, you know you 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 look at the um, in in the UK the uh, what is it the Queen Mary uh-huh. you know they they may have a museum that displays you know two thousand artifacts uh-huh. pre- that's pretty that's a pretty good display sure but they may have two hundred artifacts in the back uh huh. Uh, um, I'm sorry, not Queen Mary, Mary Rose. Oh, okay. The, the Mary, the, the, the Mary, the Mary Rose, they, you know, they have, they, they found, uh, um, long bows that were perfectly, perfectly preserved. Wow. Okay. That's great. And, and they got a great display, but in the back, they've got hundreds and hundreds of long bows. <laughs> how many, how many long bows can you put out? <laughs> right. So, <laughs> You know, I, I think for for the, the back of the house to be sitting on several hundred longbows certainly doesn't make any sense to me because you object to the private ownership of, uh, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been very fortunate on, on, on trips where, um, you know, I went out and, and uh, on like the Andrea Dory or something and I go and I get you know, uh, 20 teacups, uh-huh. for example. Well, you know what, for me to go home and it's like, wow, I got 20 teacups. Okay. I got 20 teacups. What am I going to do with them? <laughs> well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have some tea. Okay, right. Now what am I going to do? <laughs> but, but you know, if, if I take, that teacup and, and give it to a guy who is, uh, um, interested in the rack, has a relationship with the rack, uh-huh. somehow, some way, his family, his insight, all of a sudden that, you know, I literally have taken artifacts and given them to people and they turn them into like a shrine. Sure. You know, and, and it's like, so which is better? Like me, me sticking, you know, uh, uh, 20 teacups in the, my storage locker <laughs> or taking those items and, and putting them out, even though it's, it's not a museum setting, uh-huh. but I always think the artifact, it makes the artifacts out. Yeah, that, that, that absolutely makes sense. That's a, that's a really great way of looking at it. Well, John, I want to be respectful of your time. And this has been, I have not wiped the smile off my face this entire hour. It's been uh, absolutely fascinating all the way around what uh where's the best place online for people to keep up with the projects you're working on well you know i've got uh website com. okay and uh i've also got a facebook page okay great so uh there is uh i i think i think my my facebook page is a public figure page 
Okay. I think there's, there's a couple of John Chatterton pages that aren't me, so uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that's all about. But, it's your uh, alter ego. <laughs> you know, hey, maybe it is me. <laughs> Well, that's great. I'll be sure to link up uh, all that stuff in the show notes. And uh, this has been so much fun. It really, really has. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you would like to tell my listeners about? Uh, no, I, you know, I think, I think you certainly hit the highlights. Great. Well, that is wonderful to hear. And uh, yes, thank you so much for your time. I'm glad we were able to finally get this together. And I, I hope we can chat again sometime. Cool, man. You know where to find me. All right. Thanks, John. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, Phil. Bye. Bye. There it is, friends. That is the conclusion of my interview with wreck diver John Chatterton. How interesting was that? Oh, my gosh. I literally, I was smiling the whole interview talking to the guy. I mean, I could talk to him for hours. Like, wouldn't he be a great person to just to hang out with in a bar and just hear stories from? So interesting. And the Titanic stuff, I, I was... I was blown, right? Like now every time, because like uh, performers, musicians, comedians, things like that, we always, we will reference the band on the Titanic. They went down with the ship. The band played on all that kind of stuff. Uh, now I'm going to, I'll be able to tell people, no, they played on because they didn't know the ship was going down, uh, uh, which now gives me license to give up, I think. Um, but I won't, I won't never give up, never give up. So if you want to find more from John Chatterton, uh, you can follow his exploits on johnchatterton.com. Uh, and he's always doing new stuff, always looking at new wrecks. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff there that you will absolutely dig. Make sure that you're checking that out. Uh, I'll have links to uh, the books Pirate Hunters and Shadow Hunters on the show notes as well. That is under thecrossbones.com slash 028, and you can uh, get links to that. And, of course, when you click those little Amazon buttons, uh, I get a little piece of that for the show, which is very, very, very helpful. All right, our, our show today is sponsored by Southern Yellow Pine Publishing, home of author S.R. Staley's Pirate of Panther Bay book series. And you can hear, uh, I did a full interview with S.R. Staley on episode 20, so if you haven't heard that yet, make sure you check that out. We talk about a lot of good writing stuff in that one. In the books, Panther Bay book series, it's about a girl named Isabella who escapes the chains of slavery on Santa Domingue, and uh, through hard work and perseverance, she becomes the captain of a 22-gun pirate brig. Like, super awesome stuff. Uh, it's historically accurate, also has a strong female lead, which you might not think necessarily go together. Uh, but like I said, listen to that interview in uh, in episode 20, and he explains how he gets there with it. Um, historian Cindy Valor, uh, who I interviewed back in, way back in episode four, she says uh, about the books, This adventurous tale takes a circuitous journey that remains true to the real world of pirates and Spain's desire to reign over the new world. So Cindy Valor likes it. You will, too. There's two books in the uh, series so far. There's The Pirate of Panther Bay, and the second one is called Tortuga Bay. They're both available on Amazon, and you can e get them easily by if you go to underthecrossbones.com slash panther to check them out. That'll take you to S.R. Staley's author page. You can see those two books and all the other wonderful things that he've, he's written, so do that. Now, you, we must keep the modern digital pirates out of our lives. That is my message to you, friends, because they're out there. They, we don't have cool pirates with tricorn hats and swords and stuff like that anymore. No, now it's just a bunch of Cheeto eating nerds uh, who sit in front of a laptop and steal your identity information. And that's just not like, it's just not as swashbuckling, right? I mean, like it's going to be, we're going to be hard pressed for there to be, you know, uh, pirates of some backwater in Russia or something like, it's not going to, uh, it's just not the same, but they're just as dangerous, if not more, because they're out to steal your identity and it's just bad news. I've dealt with it myself. I don't want you to have to deal with it. And the way you don't deal with that is you get a membership with LifeLock and LifeLock, they keep track of all the dark, ugly parts of the web to make sure that your information is not out there. And if it is, they will help you fix it. That's the difference between LifeLock and like the, the free credit reporting stuff you get with your, your credit cards and things like that. That's cool, but they're not going to help you fix it if something does happen. LifeLock will help you do that. And you can get 10% off a LifeLock membership uh, if you use the, the uh, go to this link under the crossbones.com slash LifeLock and click the start your membership button and you will get 10% off. Uh, and you're welcome. So make sure you do that. Um, if you want, uh, would you like a free book, a free pirate book? How about Alexander Exquemelin's Pirates of um, uh, the Pirates of the Americas? Is that what it's called? Buccaneers of the Americas? Uh, Pan pirates of Panama. Pirates of Panama. Ah, you'd think I'd know that by now. Pirates of Panama or the Buccaneers of America by Alexander Exquemelin. It is a seminal book in pirate history. It's an important uh, period written 
guy was a doctor. He was on the ships with the pirates, all that kind of stuff. It's a great read, and you can get a free copy of it. Just go to underthecrossbones.com and click the uh, uh, free ebook link. Or if you're out jogging or driving or something where you're not near a computer that you can get to, uh, I can. We, you can do it by text. Uh, just text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. All right, 94253. Uh, text the word pirate and your email address. I will kick you back a link to download that ebook right to your phone where you can read it right there. Cool. All right. So we got some comedy. We got some music for you today, as usual. And uh, and I think I kept it pretty well on on theme today. I think you're, it's going to be cool. So uh, doing some comedy for you today is Irene Tu, uh, who is a San Francisco comedian. Uh, she's open for me a few times over the past couple of months, and uh, she's very funny. And I think you're going to dig her a lot. And then today we have a song called The Epic from Monkey. What? You've never heard of Monkey? Where have you been? Monkey is a 20-year-old band from here in San Jose, uh, a ska band. They have been through the ska ups and downs, and they're much more than ska. Um, so if you think chinky, 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 it's not, uh, yeah, they're, it's not that kind. Of, it's ska, but it's m- way more than that. So you're going to dig it. And uh, I'm going to play you uh, a song called The Epic from their latest album called Bananarchy, which is awesome for a band named Monkey, Bananarchy. Come on. I don't know how it took Kurt so long to get that title for an album. That should have been like, that seems like it should have been the first one. Uh, but yeah, 20 years later, he comes up with Bananarchy. Go, Kurt. Yeah. All right. So here we go. We're going to hear some comedy from Irene, too, and the epic from Monkey. Uh, I uh, work at a bookstore during the day. Do you guys remember what books are? Yes. Sometimes people are like, Do those still exist, bookstores? They do. Uh, If you don't remember books, they're kind of like records, uh, but you can read them. So if that refreshes your memory. Uh, I like working in a bookstore, but I feel like in 2015, it's kind of like being on the Titanic. Right before it's about to sink. You know, it's beautiful, right? There's like books all around me. Uh, There's an orchestra playing in the corner. They don't know what's about to happen. And right outside, there's a giant iceberg made out of Kindles. <laughs> so we're going to crash right through it. Uh, it's sad, but you know, I like it. I work, actually work at a very small uh, independent activist bookstore, uh, which means our target clientele are people who don't believe in capitalism. <laughs> Very good business model. Uh, I think our slogan is uh, not thriving. (laughs) Barely surviving. Uh, If that's the case, we're killing it. Uh, But, you know, I like the customers that we get, you know, the few. uh, They'll come in, they'll be like, oh, I want to get this book on Malcolm X. How much is it? I'm like, it's $15. They're like, I don't believe in money. (laughs) I'm like, okay, Uh, the book is still $15, Uh, don't really care if you don't believe in it, you still have to pay, Uh, but usually I feel bad, you know, I want them to have the book, I think it's important, right, so I'm like, all right, let's just go have these on it, how about you pay $7, Uh, I'll pay the rest of my paycheck, (laughs) and we'll give you the book, so, uh, What I'm saying is I volunteer at a bookstore. (laughs) It's uh, basically a library. (laughs) But we don't get any of the books back. (laughs) Yeah.
That's our show for today, friends. Thank you once again for tuning in. If you want to get all the show notes for this uh, show, it's underthecrossbones.com slash 028. You can find out more about John Chatterton at johnchatterton.com. That's Chatterton with two T's in the middle and one right before the O. Uh, if you want to hear more from Irene 2, you can go to irene2.com. Irene, like normal, 2 is T-U, irene2.com. And if you want to get more from Monkey, go to monkeyska.com. Uh, keep leaving those iTunes reviews. Very, very helpful to the show, and I appreciate the nice words as well. Again, you can get all the show notes at underthecrossbones.com slash 028. Next week on the show, we are going to be talking pirate surgery. Yeah, we're going to get detailed. We're going to get historical with pirate surgeon expert Mark Mission Kehoe. So definitely tune in for that one, and I will see you next week. Bye.